Time is a gift, fleeting and swift, ticking and talking itself away, itself away. I'm saying better beware. What was it like? Uh, since there were two, there were two different directors. There, Chuck Jones directed the animated part, and another director uh, directed the live action segments at the beginning yeah. of the end. Uh, what were the differences for you as an actor having to do part live action and part animated? Was there was there a big difference in the styles of the two directors or anything like that? Not really, not too much because Chuck was actually on the shoot the live action stuff as well. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he actually did a cameo in the in the cable car. Um, so I, you know, honestly, I don't really remember much between the two differences. I just kind of, uh, I think it was almost like interchangeable to me. I don't really recall various styles, uh, hardly at all. Uh, which, which of the two did you prefer the, the recording booth or being on set? I preferred being on set because I was just more comfortable in doing that. Uh, although I was a very good, there's a, there's a technique called looping when you have, uh, exterior noise and you've got to go into a studio and duplicate your dialogue to uh, to overlay your lip movement to where, it, to where it looks good on television. I was very good at that. So doing the voiceover stuff was uh, in front of a microphone was comfortable for me as well. So I, I kind of fit into both both arenas without uh, pretty seamlessly. Had you done any uh, voiceover work uh, prior to that? Only the stuff, like I say, looping stuff on the Munsters. That would have been the extent of it. Okay. Uh, were you familiar with the novel beforehand? Was it uh, required reading when you were in school? <laughs> no, not really, and because you know I kind of pretty much left public school system when I was in the second grade. Um, I mean, I was back and forth between it, but when I got the Munsters in the fifth grade, I was definitely pulled out of school, and that's usually when that book was read. Yeah, I think uh, I was in fifth grade when it was uh, exactly. mandatory. By then, I had already watched the movie a hundred times, so it was mm-hmm. almost pointless. <laughs> it was really, it's you know, it was it's an interesting situation on that. Well, I'll, I'll let you, I'll, you go ahead with your questions, and I'll and I'll answer them as you. That way, we stay in continuity. Okay, no problem. Uh, what are your memories of working with Chuck Jones himself? Uh, were you familiar with his work before landing that role? Absolutely. Yeah, I was a huge Chuck Jones fan from the animation stuff, obviously. And uh, he was, you know, he was kind of like a, you know, he kind of had to me, he was like an Uncle Chuck, the guy that could draw stuff. You know, he just had a very friendly demeanor about him, regular guy, you know, the kind of guy you'd want to invite to Thanksgiving dinner or you'd want to go visit uh, at the lake and go fishing with. And he was just, just a really easygoing type of person that was a joy to be around. And uh, and the fact that he happened to be this incredible animator with all these great cartoons in his hip pocket just made it that much more exciting to know him. I was at the Chuck Jones um, Gallery not too long ago in San Diego, and there there's st- there are a couple there are a couple cartoons he used to lend there for sale. I'm, I almost considered it, but they're kind of high price. So yeah, are you talking about like one of his centers for creativity, or just a straight up gallery? Uh, it's a it's a straight up gallery. It's just yeah. right down the road from the convention center. Yeah, it's got yeah. it's got original animation stills and some yeah. uh, paintings and uh, other repro- uh, reproductions of his work. Yeah, cool. Uh, when you were in the recording studio, did you were you performing by yourself or were you with in there with like uh, Mel uh, Mel Blanc and uh, Dawes Butler and Hans Conrad? Most of the stuff that I did, I wasn't there with them, but I spent most of the time I. Pretty much, I'm pretty sure Dawes was was talk the watchdog, uh, if 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 I remember my my voices correctly, you know, and and I had most of my dialogue with him, but I worked with all of them at one time or another. Uh, what was your experience with working with them? Were they did they did they kind of show you the ropes of uh, voice acting for cartoons? No, not really. Uh, it was interesting for me because they were actually, you know, they were doing voices. You know, they were, mm-hmm. you know, they were jumping around. I was just being monotone myself as Milo. So for me, it was another day at the at the looping stage. But for me, watching and listening to them, it was really enjoyable to see to see these guys uh, uh, doing what they do best and you know the, their craft. Uh, what did you think of the finished version of the film? Uh, was it was everything that you recorded uh, present on the film, or were there some things cut? I think it's pretty much seen. I didn't know. I, I I didn't see any noticeable holes in it from what I remember. But you know, I was a kid. It's a long time ago. And and, mm-hmm. and, the, and the thing with this movie, it took two years to complete from the time we started to the time we finished. 
because of the every two or three months I get a call to go back to MGM and do some more voiceover work as they were develop as they were you know doing the animation. Was it just because the animation process is so lengthy, or yes, was yeah. there something? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you <laughs> when when people uh, talk to you about it? What are some of their favorite memories of of you in that movie? Do, do they share those with you? Most of the time, they just they, it's from the book. They just really enjoy the book. It's one of their favorite books, and uh, that's really where the, the the real fan base came from. That movie was that people enjoyed Chuck Jones's animation, but it was the book that sold them on it. And that's you know when I have people come up, they they basically are talking about the book, the movie they enjoy, but the book is what, is what led them to the movie. Mm-hmm. Um. Have you have you heard anything about uh, any kind of remastering or anything coming up for the 50th anniversary, or is it just gonna just roll by and it's just gonna be like a story on some website somewhere? Hopefully not. I haven't heard anything about that, you know, and it's and it's kind of it's kind of sad because you know I don't know if, if, when we get to the end of your questions, then I'll go back in case you haven't asked me a couple things. I'll I'll bring you up the speed on, but let's sure. get through your questions and then if we haven't touched on what I you know the, a couple things I want to enlighten you with, then I'll go back. Yeah, um, that that more or less wraps it up for me with my uh, okay. direct questions about about the production. The interesting thing about this movie, and, and I and I found this out not so much at the time, but most more so afterwards. MGM, the the thing about the movie was Chuck Jones's vision for this movie was to be on TV annually, very much like The Wizard of Oz. Mm-hmm. That was his thought process. MGM produced it, and at the time, what unfortunately what happened was right when the movie was finished. In 1968, 69, 70-ish, right as they were wrapping this thing up, MGM got out of the movie business. They sold off all their holdings, the studio, and they went into the hotel business in Las Vegas with the MGM Grand Hotel. So what happened was is the movie never really got the push it deserved for the exposure of its release, and it just kind of fell through the cracks. It was always well-received. It was was always um, well-reviewed, but it never got the big release that Chuck was looking for. And that why it, it just never really got the steam going behind it. And obviously it never got onto the TV thing as an annual event. So unfortunately all this work and stuff, cause you know, it was several years of his life and uh, this and that, and he never had a chance to uh, really get the audience that he was hoping it would get. Why do you think there was, there was such a lag in uh, audience participation for this film? Because MGM got out of the movie business and didn't promote it. So it was just all down to promotion dollars at yes, that point. Yes, absolutely. Whenever you make a movie, you have to, you know, you basically you have the same amount of money for, for promoting it and the same amount of money as to make it. It's a 50-50 split. And when they made it, they took all the money out of the budget for the promotion of it to go build their hotel. It was just bad timing, unfortunately. But then it saw its resurgence in the 80s. I mean, the first time I saw it was probably like maybe 86 or 87 from an old VHS copy and then – it seems to have kind of a cult following, but I wouldn't actually call it a cult movie because it's a great no. animated film, a major animated film. Yeah. I don't Turner, know exactly what to classify it as. Well, Ted, well, Ted Turner bought bought a bunch of, you know, when he opened up his Ted Turner Classic Movies, when he bought up a shitload of Hollywood movies, it was in that package. And he brought it out and started showing it uh, on Turner Classic Movies, and where it where it's sort of found an audience, it's probably a bigger audience than it ever had before. And from that, because so many people with cable boxes and Turner Classic Movie stuff started watching it. That's kind of where it got a shot in the arm. And then the fact that the book is still in curriculum, you know, and it's, it's got that going for it. Now the 50th anniversary, um, I've done screenings with the movie before with book clubs where they, they rent the theater and they, we, we do a promotion where, you know, I, I let people know about it on the radio and TV, and then they come out with their books to get autographed and they watch the movie. Um, as like a, as a as a book club slash movie club at like the Alamo Brewhouse Theaters, and we we always get a few hundred people out to the screen. I mean, it's always it's always had a nice solid little draw, and they really enjoy it. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some more of those this year. I'd, I'd I'd love for the I'd love for you to come back to Tampa. That way, I can see you locally and see it. <laughs> or, if, or if I'm uh, or if I'm out in California sometime. But yeah, I, I'd like to see more of that happen, especially with with books that have had some kind of adaptation into another medium. Well, if you, if you find a small theater or some theater that wants to do it, you know, you know where to find me, and it's easy enough to market and promote because the combination of the fans of Chuck Jones, the animator, the fans of the book, 
in the literary community and the fans of the Munsters. You have, you know, three really solid groups that you can tap into to collaborate on filling a room up or filling a theater up for a screening and it's family friendly, you know, and, and mm-hmm. kids, people that watch it, people that viewed it as a kid now have kids and grandkids. And if they haven't had a chance to read it or seen the movie, it's really a good feel good thing for multi-generations to come out together to, to do a movie the afternoon matinee and meet Eddie Munster and Milo and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Awesome, perfect. Which I think that that pretty much encompasses everything that uh, I was looking to uh, to get. But if you have anything else you want to add, I mean, feel free. No, that's pre- that's pretty much about that's pretty much it. Uh, the fact that I've I've seen the screening with with Chuck's grandson, uh, Craig Cosson. I've signed a lot of cells at the Centers of Creativity. I've worked hand in hand with Chuck and his people and his and his families and this and that. And like you know my. Probably my most prized possession that I have of everything I've done in my career was the Roadrunner that Chuck drew for me on the set up in San Francisco when I asked him how long I took to draw a Roadrunner, and he shooed me off to go get him something. And when he came back, I came back five minutes later, and he had it completed in the bottom corner. It goes to Butch Milo Patrick from the Phantom Roadrunner at Chuck huh. Jones. And it's like the only, you know, you know, that's the only one ever and the millions and millions of, of sketches he made of the Roadrunner. You know, that's the only one that's, that's personalized like that. <laughs> that's awesome. 